Hi everyone. At its peak, the Roman Empire completely encircled the Mediterranean Sea, which first century Romans conveniently called Mare Nostrum, or R.C. Not only did its waters provide fish to feed citizens from Mauritania to Hispania, it also facilitated inter-empire trade between the various provinces. Roman merchants moved all sorts of goods and foodstuffs by sea. Commercial vessels were known by a variety of names, such as Corbita, Gaulus, Ponto, or Cladivata, depending upon the region. Overall, the ships demonstrated great uniformity in design. They mostly seem to be of a similar type, being broad round vessels with a high stern and the stern post bent inwards. This model is based on a wreckage found on the seabed at the coast of Elba. The wreck is believed to be from 1st century BC. The large number of shipwrecks found around the Mediterranean illustrates not only the quantity of shipping that took place, but the perils of traveling by sea in earlier times. Depending on size and intended use of the ship, the hull shape could be either symmetrical or asymmetrical. In the first case the stern and bow were essentially identical. In the asymmetric version, the bow was located at a lower height. The bow was sometimes concave, due to the presence of a cut water. These were added not as a ram, but a structural modification to improve the vessel's sailing ability. Unlike the warships that utilized rowers to quickly maneuver and propel the ship, merchant ships relied exclusively upon sails for propulsion. The illustrations show a single masted ship, however as the vessel's size and tonnage increased they added a second and even a third mast. The sails were square and controlled by a complex system of rigging. Many ships also featured a smaller sail, called a separum, on the bow which aided steering. The size of Roman ships On the low end were ships designed for the grain trade, which carried 10,000 modii of grain, a little over 75 tons. These were the workhorses of the fleet running regular routes to nearby provinces to load wheat or barley. A government contract provided the ship owner with a steady source of income as his ship traced and retraced the same path back and forth between Rome and Sicily, Alexandria, or other export points. Medium-sized ships were used extensively for the olive oil trade and were measured by the number of amphorae they could hold. A 3,000 amphora vessel had almost three times the capacity of the smaller ships, carrying 165,000 tons. The size of these ships is confirmed by numerous underwater explorations of shipwrecks. In addition to the specialized use previously mentioned, smaller and medium-sized ships hauled general merchandise as well. Metal ores and other raw materials, spices, silk and other trade goods moved with surprising regularity. For instance, in the first century 120 ships a year set sail for India from the Red Sea port of Bernica. Their return cargo consisted of pepper which was moved by barge to Alexandria, and from there to Rome on still more ships. The Roman fleet also had higher tonnage vessels. The hull of the Madrogdagenes, that floundered off Gaul, France, in the 1st century BC, was 130 feet long with an estimated capacity of 440 tons. In the early years of the Roman Empire, the Murio Forio, 10,000 amphora carriers carrying 550 tons were the largest ships afloat. The grain trade also utilized some 50,000 modii vessels which hauled 365 tons. The size and capacity of these ships was not exceeded in the Mediterranean until the 16th century. For olive oil and many other commodities, amphorae became the standard shipping container. When hearing the word amphora, many people think of an urn-like container. In fact, amphora is also a unit of measurement. An amphora equaled three modius. Since a modius contains two and a half gallons of liquid, each amphora represents seven and a half gallons. So, if the 2,500 amphora comprised the entire cargo, the ship was carrying 18,750 gallons, or 150,000 pounds, of wine when
Like most colonizing powers, over time Rome grew dependent upon the influx of goods from the provinces to survive. Each year 60 million modii of grain arrived in Rome. Navigation was not the year-round affair that it is today. Every winter saw the arrival of the Mare Clausum or Closed Sea that lasted four months. Subtracting this period of inactivity computes to an average of five large grain ships arriving every navigable day. It has also been calculated that seven or more large shiploads of olive oil docked each month. To those must be added the ships that transported wine, fish products, spices, cloth, ore, marble and stone blocks. There were also shiploads of wild animals arriving from Africa and elsewhere for use in the games. All of this merchandise directed at Rome had to come through the port of Ostia and later the port of Claudius. Merchant ships which exceeded a 3,000 amphora capacity, about 165 tons, could not travel upstream. They were obliged to anchor at sea and unload their cargo onto smaller vessels which shuttled between the ships and the river entrance to the port of Ostia. These operations were lengthy and dangerous operations. The coastline in that area was inhospitable, low, and sandy. Shipbuilding in ancient Rome was more of an art relying on rules of thumb, inherited techniques and personal experience rather than an engineering science. The Romans were not traditionally sailors but mostly land-based people who learned to build ships from the people that they conquered, namely the Carthaginians, and their Phoenician predecessors, the Greeks and the Egyptians. There are a few surviving written documents that provide descriptions and representations of ancient Roman ships concerning the masts, sails and rigging. Excavated vessels also provide some clues on ancient shipbuilding techniques. What studies of these ancient documents and excavated vessels have taught us is that ancient Roman shipbuilders built the outer hull first, then proceeded with the frame and the rest of the ship. Planks used to build the outer hull were initially sewn together. Starting from the 6th century BCE, they were joined together using the locked mortise and tenon method. Then in the first centuries of the current era, Mediterranean shipbuilders shifted to another shipbuilding method, still in use today, which consisted of building the frame first and then proceeding with the hull and the other components of the ship. This method was more systematic and dramatically shortened ship construction times. Merchant ships were built to transport lots of cargo over long distances and at a reasonable cost, therefore speed and maneuverability were not a priority. They had a length to breadth ratio of the underwater hull of about 3 to 1, double planking and a ballast for added stability. Their V-shaped hull was deep underwater meaning that they could not sail too close to the coast. They usually had two huge side rudders, or steering oars, located off the stern and controlled by a small tiller bar connected to a system of cables. Thanks for watching.